All right, well, my name is Emma Truitt. I am the phase one municipal permit writer for the Department of Ecology, and I will be your moderator today. Um, so I think we've probably all got the drill by now, um, but just in case you need a reminder, please go ahead and turn your cell phones off. Um, it'll be a 20 minute presentation with 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. Uh, the presentation itself will be recorded, but the Q&A will not, so. Thank you for coming to the session um, on the Our Green Duwamish Stormwater Strategy. Um, here we have Todd Hunsdorfer and Carly Grayell um, giving the talk today. So Todd, for nearly a decade, has worked on a variety of programs focused on improving stormwater quality. He has extensive experience managing stormwater education and outreach programs, administering infrastructure operation and maintenance programs, TMDL implementation, and commercial and construction code compliance programs. At King County, he implements water quality grants and a variety of other programs related to water quality. Carly has a degree in environmental toxicology from Western Washington University and has worked in King County's Water and Land Resources Division since 2013. During this time, she has worked on projects addressing pathways of priority pollutants to the Lower Duwamish Waterway, literature reviews about bioretention performance, studies on stormwater treatment effectiveness, and strategic planning efforts related to stormwater management and water quality improvements. So welcome. I don't have the timer set up. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having us here today. I want to thank the uh, planning committee. Um, I also want to uh, recognize, you know, I, I, this has been really exciting for me. I've had some really good conversations with people who aren't even from Western Washington, and they're still here, they're still here learning about managing stormwater. And to me, it's, uh, I, I think it's representative of uh, the good work that we're doing throughout the state. And I want to acknowledge that I, people from Idaho and Spokane and, um, and also Portland. So uh, in addition to that, I'm noticing from the uh, keynote address how things have started to shift a little bit. And, and then on top of that, uh, being in one of the conferences next door here, listening to the diverse organizations working on stormwater management, how we're starting to kind of cross-pollinate uh, and find new ways of managing stormwater. And that's really invigorating to me, and it's kind of at the heart of what we're doing here. Uh, I also want to thank the Department of Ecology for uh, a number of steps that, that you've taken in order to make a lot of these discussions possible, starting at least um, not too long ago with the ad hoc committee and having those conversations around development of the draft permit language. Um, committing dollars to the structural source control group to look at the point system and making that effective for everybody. So um, I want to acknowledge that too because that's, that's also uh, a big part of what we're dealing with here uh, in terms of thinking about how we're managing stormwater in a way that sits outside of, uh, the, outside of the permit in conjunction with and outside. So. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so talking with people not from this area, I realized that this map may not be helpful, but uh, this, is a, this, is the, this is the green uh, Duwamish waterway. Uh, many of you may know um, kind of where geographically Seattle, Elliott Bay is up here, right? So we're, we're right down here by the airport. Um, and then, yeah, and then it goes all the way up. Uh, a large portion of it, the lower, the lower portion of it is um, heavily dominated by industrial land use, uh, urban environments. And then as you move further up the watershed, uh, you have more agricultural, recreational, open space, um, suburban um, environments, and then, and, and then above the Howard Hansen Dam, it turns into wilderness pre uh, pretty quickly. So um, watershed's incredibly diverse land use, and um, <clears throat> that was one reason why in 2014 there was a joint effort between the city of Seattle and King County to um, improve the health of the watershed by working with the community. And at that time, the goals of the initiative were related to uh, cleaner air, so um, reducing particulates, for example, controlling smog, uh, improving water quality, so stormwater control, um, pollution source control, you guys can all read that stuff there. Um, and then also increasing access to open space and uh, improving that with a lens of equity and social justice. 
related to all of these things. And, then, and the plan was to engage the community in crafting a larger vision and strategies to achieve these goals. Um, and that's what resulted in the formation of what's called the Watershed Advisory Group. And the Watershed Advisory Group uh, decided that uh, of all of these issues they were talking about, there were, there were four primary um, legs to the stool here that were of the most interest. And um, the Department of Natural Resources and Parks uh, was uh, tasked with uh, administering the stormwater, or following up on developing the stormwater strategy. So um, getting to this point required a significant amount of work. I don't, was anybody here involved in the Watershed Advisory Group? I feel like maybe Erica was. Uh, yeah, so there, so um, getting here, it was process heavy, a lot of conversations, a lot of difficult conversations about priorities, and, um, <clears throat> but it was worth it, I think. It set up the infrastructure to, uh, for us to move into the phase two um, portion of the, of uh, this initiative, and phase two was about understanding how we could improve aquatic health of the river through managing stormwater. So the overall strategy included a vision, it included a mission uh, statement. So the mission statement, I wanna read for you, we will improve and accelerate watershed scale stormwater management actions in the Green Duwamish watershed collaboratively with community, jurisdictions, agencies, nonprofits, and businesses, we will manage the quality and quantity of stormwater runoff by prioritizing actions that have multiple benefits, advancing equity, social justice, and the economy, aligning non-regulatory with regulatory interests, securing sustainable funding resources, and preserving and restoring receiving waters. It's a, it's a mouthful. That is a big mission statement. It's reflective, I think, of the, of the diversity of participants but it was something that we were able to reach agreement on. And the nice thing is because it's so comprehensive, it allows us to include a lot of different actions, right? <clears throat> so um, in addition, the, the phase two uh, stormwater strategy outlines a bunch of goals, objectives, strategies. These all roll up. There's a nice summary sheet. I'm uh, very uh, excited about how many people are in the room. I only made 20 of these summary sheets, <laughs> so you can... Uh, if you're interested, they're up at the front here, um, and at the end, it may make more sense for you to take a look at them uh, if you're curious about what types of objectives and goals we're going to be discussing um, at future meetings. So, Any of you who have participated in a process similar to this know that um, it can take a significant amount of time. I, I've uh, just today witnessing some of the planning conversations that have taken place in this room uh, I was, uh, I, it reinforced my understanding of how long process can take. And, um, and so making sure that there's enough time built in to do that adequately and provide the backbone for moving forward. So I'm sure everyone here has participated in developing some sort of plan at some point or another, and then put that on a bookshelf and sat back and looked at the spine of that plan and maybe not done anything that was in that plan or not ever referenced it ever again. Um, we're uh, hoping to avoid that here. So um, uh, we also uh, are in the process of revamping our website, but this is another resource for you if, you're of, uh, if it's of any interest to, to find any um, of the backup documentation that went into developing these various elements. So uh, <clears throat> that brings us to phase three. And I have no idea how many phases we're going to have in this project. <laughs> That's sort of the nature of this project. And I think um, as, we, as it evolves, it's uh, an element um, that, to me, is one of the more exciting pieces. Um, so our two-year work, work plan has us completing the uh, implementation plan for implementing our strategy by the end of 2020. The uh, organization of the content of this plan is yet to be determined, but we're in the process of putting that together. So to be successful um, in implementing the strategy, we've uh, embedded a bunch of transparency in the way that we're doing things. So we started to build on this by uh, having conversations around our decision-making process as a stakeholder group. 
And during this process, we heard that there was a lot of interest from our stakeholders around uh, moving the conversation towards one where there's, they're more heavily influencing the outcome. And this is this co-design and collaboration style of um, developing the implementation plan. And this allows, um, this actually transitions us into uh, this proposed idea of developing subgroups focused on specific areas of the stormwater strategy um, that, so this allows us to really leverage the specific skills of the individual stakeholders. There are people who are more well versed in obtaining um, long term funding. There are people interested in um, what Carly's going to be talking a little bit more about with this mapping tool and the way we might use GIS to help inform making progress on our stormwater strategy. And then um, we're going to need help building out the implementation plan as well. So, um, so related to the, the work around the mapping tool and tracking progress, we saw a real opportunity to unify uh, how we might support NPDES permit compliance with the work that we're doing within the watershed. So, um, do, so, so we, this, the, the support of the NPDES permit requirements was uh, a significantly important um, part of what we're trying to do here with this initiative. We want to talk about the mapping tool and its relevance to permit compliance. And although we haven't seen the final permit language for the NPDES phase two uh, permits, uh, most likely it's uh, the stormwater management action plans are going to be in there, included in there. And then on top of that, there may be an opportunity to meet compliance through a regional or watershed based approach. Uh, and we want to uh, make that a make participation in this particular initiative something that allows phase twos to, to meet their permit requirements in that area. So um, Carly's going to talk about our mapping tool. Thanks. I think I'm just going to hold this because that might be easier. Um, so I'm Carly. Thanks, everyone. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the uh, stormwater monitoring action plan that's proposed under phase two, but really in how the mapping tool we were already talking about developing for supporting the Our Green Duwamish initiative and the implementation of the stormwater strategy, how we saw those aligning, where we see um, some commonalities already and where we can just make some slight adjustments to make sure that it's um, directly useful for permit compliance. So some of the steps that are proposed um, in the, the uh, draft guidance for the SMAP process is basin delineation. So where are the basins? Where does your jurisdiction overlap with those basins? And then basin characteristics, what sort of land use uh, might be important for those basins? What can you, what do you know about those basins to inform where you might want to do um, different types of stormwater actions? Um, and then also um, with that uh, prioritization, coming up with a, um, so a list of candidate basins for where you might want to do different types of stormwater management actions. So. The first one, um, we already have a little bit of a start. This is um, uh, just showing um, different basins delineated throughout the watershed, and the colors are just serving to differentiate those, there's not any uh, meaning behind those. But um, so far, we already have these basins delineated as King County. Um, this is Huck 12, and then also some smaller basins from some different project-specific uh, needs that had um, come up over the years, but we're working to get this more standardized, trying to go to a more fine scale basin delineation um, uh, to um, Huck 14 or 16, if that um, uh, makes sense to anyone, if that matters, just thinking about the, how, how fine of scale. This is all based on topography. We're also thinking about what their, um, how we might be able to look at circuits of um, within a stormwater system and think about basins of an outfall on a circuit system. So that's really, it's pretty complicated and it might be difficult to do on a large watershed scale, but we're looking into some options for that. And um, the other thing that we can do is uh, some of our, the jurisdictions that are part of this watershed are, uh, have parts of the jurisdiction that are outside the watershed. And this, uh, this data layer can exist outside just these watershed boundaries so we can include basins for the other areas of um, people's jurisdictions. So just a note there. So then we can pull on other landscape data that everyone's going to want to have. We might as well put it in one, one place and everyone can use it in the way that they, they would like to for um, satisfying their permit requirements. So we have things like uh, impervious surface. Um, this can tell us uh, about um, how uh, 
what sort of runoff volumes you might get, uh, maybe a little bit about contaminants. And so this is just showing those same basins, but now they're color coded by the um, uh, percent impervious surface. So the darker areas have uh, higher percent impervious surface for that basin um, and moving into the lighter areas. We can also put on information about land use. So this is showing uh, commercial and industrial land use um, or zoning. Um, the darker areas have higher percentage of that type of land use. And that could be useful if you're thinking about uh, where you might need um, uh, for business inspections. If you're thinking about source control, um, you might have different types of uh, contaminant loads coming off these types of land uses. So that's one way that this could be used. And this is really information that everyone is going to want to have, and we can have it all in one spot here. Um, you can also think about canopy cover. And um, so here, the darker areas have higher percent canopy cover. Um, this has been shown to be pretty well correlated with um, BIBI scores, so benthic uh, invertebrate scores, um, thinking about stream health. So that's one way you can look at this. Um, and then we're also we're talking about multiple benefits. Um, we this is looking at the um, density of red spawning for Chinook salmon in from uh, um, some of the latest from Raya Nine. Um, this would be one way to think about salmon habitat. So we took the areas that had the most dense uh, red, um, red Chinook reds and showed which basins are draining directly to those. So that would just be one way to take into account where which basins have potentially direct impacts on salmon habitat. So you might have some multiple benefits if you're putting in some flow control, some treatment in those basins. It might be directly protecting some salmon habitat. You can also think about restoration projects and map those as well. These are all things that we're talking about. Um, you can also think about directly putting on information about pollutant loading. So the Nature Conservancy, this is a screenshot of their beta version of the heat map of pollutants um, for stormwater, looking at the, the lightest areas of um, uh, estimated higher solids loads. So this is be really uh, useful information, and we're looking at how to pull this type of information onto uh, this map as well. So taking that, you can put that all together and thinking about um, how you would want to prioritize. You might want to do different, you might want to prioritize different basins for different types of actions. So if we're thinking about source control goals, which is uh, we have a reduced toxics as our first goal area in our stormwater strategy, we can put together some of this land use information to come up with some areas we might want to to do this. So before I show these, this is all just um, in the very early stages of talking about what's possible. This isn't recommendations from the group by any means. But what we have so far is you might want to think about that industrial commercial zoning as kind of a surrogate for potential loadings of um, different contaminants or where you might have more opportunities for source control actions. And here we took out just the highest um, the areas with the highest percent industrial and commercial zoning shown in orange. Then we can also look at the areas with the highest percent impervious surface, kind of for the same reasonings, thinking about where you might be having higher loadings. And then another thing to think about is if your source control purpose is thinking about PCBs, which is a, um, a contaminant of concern for the Superfund site in the lower Duwamish, so that might be something we want to look at. You can think about when, uh, so PCBs are more common in materials that were built um, for buildings in 1930s, 1970s, so if you're looking at parcels that were developed during that time, you might have higher um, uh, PCBs potentially coming from some of those parcels, so we've shown the basins that have higher percent uh, parcels developed during that key time, and that might be areas you'd want to prioritize for PCB source control. And so if you put those all together, you can come up with some candidate basins of where you might want to uh, target those types of activities. Again, this is just for discussion purposes so far. Uh, thinking about a different goal, uh, restoration goal, you can think about um, uh, somewhere where you have some degradation, but uh, somewhere you could maybe still come back from. Restoration goals um, uh, was one of the things that's so far um, outlined in the guidance for SMAP. Um, but so we're using canopy cover right now just as a, this would be potentially fair scoring streams um, for health, uh, just as a, as a surrogate for now. And you can take that and think about where um, you have that important salmon habitat. Right now we're just looking at red density and where those overlap might be areas that you would want to think about restoration. Um, this is a, then a great opportunity to be coordinating with um, your different organizations looking at salmon recovery, see if there's opportunities, if there's a new restoration site, if you have storm, you could put in uh, stormwater controls 
um, that's draining to those areas, it's a great opportunity for multiple benefit projects. So having it all on a map allows us to think about those things um, and maybe be able to identify them more easily. Um, the other thing we really wanted to do that's a little bit outside of what the permit's requiring, but just tracking progress in our goals. How are we doing? So we still need to do some work in our subgroups to think about exactly what what are our goals? What are we going to set as our goals? And then once we have those, what data do we need to be collecting in order to be tracking our progress on those? So I'm just gonna go through an example. We have one strategy uh, in, our, um, in the overall strategy. So this gets down to the very specific strategy of retrofit under functioning flow control facilities. So if we had a goal for that and we wanted to track progress, what sort of information would we need to collect? We need to know how many uh, we have, where are they, and which are under-functioning. So for right now, under-functioning, we can talk about how to, how to um, decide which, which one, how to assess that, which uh, f uh, flow control facilities would be under-functioning. But right now, we can think about uh, maybe our oldest facilities uh, might be under-functioning, whereas our newer facilities are probably functioning better. So we just, um, right now, put up King County flow control facilities um, color-coded by the age that they were built, or the year that they were built. And so the ones in red were built earliest. Um, so we have a lot of red on there right now. Um, but we're, uh, so this would be something we could track over time, see how it changes. You can also think about where you might wanna prioritize where you're retrofitting. So we talked about a lot of different ways to prioritize. Here's just showing um, impaired water bodies, um, or basins that drain to impaired water bodies. So that would that could be one way you would want to um, prioritize. Um, so we're, just as a, an example of what that could look like. Um, but thinking about tracking this over time, we could have, um, these are imaginary numbers right now, but you can um, throw up uh, the, the number of facilities you have in the different ages, or if there's a cutoff that we've decided as a group, that is, these ones are under-functioning, these ones are functioning. And you can just track that over time. You can set a goal. Maybe let's say we're going to reduce our under-functioning facilities by 20%. We can track that over time as we are re retrofitting those. Now they're new ones. We've increased the, the blue, decreasing the red. Maybe we're going to build new facilities. Um, we have a goal maybe of increasing that by 10% across the watershed and increasing that over time. Um, but this gives us a method to be able to track our progress. The other thing is it's scalable. So I've been talking about all this on a watershed wide scale, but if the way we're trying to create this mapping tool would be that you can do all those analyses, all those prioritizations on a watershed scale, but you could also just pick out an area that's draining, um, that a jurisdiction um, within jurisdiction boundaries of, or what's where a jurisdiction is draining to and do that same analysis just in that area. So it's a way that we can work together and have some, some common language and see opportunities for collaboration, but it would also be a tool that individual jurisdictions could use for their, their own uses. Um, so next steps, um, this is what Todd showed earlier, but we're just starting to put these subgroups together to get people who are um, really wanting to focus in on a particular topic. And the first one that really rises to the top is this mapping tool, um, particularly thinking about how it can be used to um, help satisfy SMAP requirements that are proposed. So we are just in the process now of um, forming up that subgroup. And if you're interested in, um, in getting involved, you can contact Todd or I. Um, our next um, full stakeholder meeting is June 13th in Tequila at 9.30 a.m. And we want to thank the Waterworks Grant Program for helping fund this work and all the stakeholders that have been involved. Thank you.